I was abused by a worship leader in the Pentecostal mm -hmm. Holiness Church by the time I was 10. It was on the way to church. And then he grabbed his guitar out of the truck and went to the front of the stage. And I'm in the truck like, are you kidding me? Childhood sexual abuse or something entering that like whew, a destiny is just taken out. Yeah. And then you spend the rest of your life covering and it's shame upon shame. And you know, you, you have these addictions that form, whether it's shopping, eating, you know, abuse happens and you run away and then you're with the worst guy and then you can't say to him. So when I was specifically in the trafficking realm the last 10 years, it was like presented as the new thing and we need to talk about trafficking. And I kept saying, well, the root, like the way I saw it and the way it was explained to me is it was no different than what I've seen for the last 20 years that children, one out of three little girls and one out of five little boys are sexually abused. Mm -hmm. And then that's chronic so they're mixing love and abuse it's a lot of times their dad a brother a church pastor you know someplace they should feel safe and in that confusion they don't know they don't know boundaries and their identity is all confused and often they'll run away within 48 hours a runaway in any zip code in america will be approached by a predator and he lures them in just by saying hey i bet you need a place to sleep did anyone ever tell you how beautiful you were and then within 48 hours he has them hooked on a drug and they're sold 15 to 40 times a day the wow. focus has been on that child getting healed you know we get them you know typically in the life seven years and if they're not dead they might get rescued you know one in a million gets rescued and then we have beds and i ran safe homes for a decade and it was the same story same story of these these girls with deception abuse shame abuse shame abuse shame and then they numb 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 yeah. but they would tell their story and they're no different than the stories from the north shore but i think the lord set up this sex trafficking as the charity du jour for the last yeah. decade it's gotten a lot of attention and after about a you know 10 years into it and all the focus being here it, it just sort of grew into that discontent like lord how do we get ahead of this if we don't get everybody really paying attention to this is a abuse and this is a family issue and this is parents not knowing what's going on these are you know no one's speaking about it and so many of the girls i would tell you probably half their stories came from church and wow. we started you know, creating the different systemic pathways that law enforcement, ER docs, teachers, we have all this train the trainer that we scale on a national and global level. But the last year, it's like the Lord downloaded, whew, this is it for the church. And it's like this, we called it when I was at the World Evangelical thing, they said, if it's not a scalable catalytic program, we don't want to hear about it. And I said, oh my yeah. gosh, we call ours a catalytic Holy Spirit can opener because <laughs> it's both in the church and it's that pops the top and it's beautiful. And, and the thing is, it's there, it's not like a, oh no, be scared. I think be scared if you don't want to do it because the way the headlines are going and the scandals and the pastors falling and always a pastor in a sex trafficking sting, always a youth pastor in a sex trafficking wow. sting. Every, yeah. everyone I've had, and even recently, you know, around Disney World, you had a Disney worker, a pastor, a youth group leader, a high school teacher. Wow. And, it's it's finally getting everyone to say hey we've we've understood the girl we love the girl everyone wants to buy her clothes everyone wants to help her get a job guess what that's wonderful but what if we go back here where we have over half a million of our own american kids if we have one out of three that end up being abused sexually and then you, they say half a million end up trafficked all those shades of gray in the middle are kids that are losing their identities and that's the church. The church should be leading the narrative, but instead we're stepping back because the narrative's getting, well, we don't want to, you know, cause any division. And yeah. the confusion is becoming normalized and we don't want to offend anybody. And so what I spoke with at the conference was just about this. It's called Real Talk and it's a catalytic Holy Spirit can opener. And if the church embraces this for kindergarten through leadership, it'll change the way we speak. It'll change the lens of which we're able to look at things and communicate and give our kids this freedom. So we're not grooming the next generation to have the same secrets. I've had yeah. two really close friends that were married 30 to 40 years, pastors, wives, both run up to me in the last 60 days and say, Elizabeth, how were my eyes closed this whole time? I wondered why I always cared about what you did. And somehow for the first time, I'm seeing his cell phone. He has a whole secret life. And, wow. and, I, and I think that by us as the church not talking about 
what's going on? Or, you know, her husband said, well, they're just escorts. And she's like, it's trafficking. It's what mm-hmm. Elizabeth does. How do you know they're not under 18? And, and, and we just don't speak into that. And the whole secret of the sexual stuff is like, we don't talk about sex, we're in church. And we should be leading the narrative. God created sex. So oh. I sort of just presented it like, hey, let's take back every mountain and God talk about sex. And they yeah. loved it. <laughs> I love it. The, you know, the church of the world, these leaders are loving it. And it's because they know that there's this problem. I mean, like we know there's this problem. I was thinking about after I talked to you the first time and you told me that the first, the AIDS that girls showed themselves naked through photos first is like seven years old. When I and started, I, it was 12. Now years. it's seven. It's seven. And I was like, I was telling my wife about this. And then uh, Hartley, the next day, my little daughter who's seven came and she goes, Dan, Look at this program that it's advertising right now on my normal app. Now she's on restricted under eight year old or whatever, they, you know, whatever. And it was like this game that looks like Kim Kardashian and someone else in animation form, but very badly dressed, kissing, like making out. And I look at the game and I go into the app store and it's targeted for five to eight year olds. That's the target audience for the game. And it was completely like, it's like pre-sex sex basically. And Hartley was aware enough to go, there's something wrong with this. Like, can, can you tell me what's going on? And I was like, it's a kissing game. Let's just get off that. But then I was like, I'm not even safe with, I, there's no parental controls. I can control that out of my games. And then there's other games that are like, you know, like Roblox and their games where the first time I played, I think it was Minecraft or Roblox with my girls online. There, there was people making naked drawings and, and we had to completely get off of it right away. And I was just in a normal chat room that was safe that has guards on it. And they were doing a picture game and the people were making naked pictures of women. And I'm like, oh, so we can't go online. So this is like they're at a stage where this is what's there, and they're it's they're grooming. they're telling me, but our grooming. friends can go on. And I'm like, yeah, but we're gonna protect you, and we're gonna explain and talk and have real conversations with you about this. And it was so cool to hear that you had a program called Real. It's called Real Talk, that actually helps people to have conversations because that's the missing piece. Is parents don't feel empowered because they're failing, and then they won't have the talks with their kids because they they're in shame. So if you're in shame, you don't talk about shameful things, right? And so I love the fact that you opened up the can of worms of the Holy Spirit. And I love the fact that your trafficking background, which when Bob, when she talks about helping women, she's, she, they've helped women by the thousands, not the hundreds. Yeah. I have organizations that are friends that have helped one home with you know 17 women at a time. Yes. You guys have done by the thousands for the last 10 years. And you, the fact that you, you love that, but you saw that you can go deeper into the roots. So I just think it's, it's an eye opener awakener to what we're going into is what God wants to heal in our generation. There's an empowerment here to be had. So take us on the journey, take us a little bit deeper background because you ended up getting awakened to a lot of this and even going after your master's degree and the whole thing because of your own experience with God, take us on that journey. Well, I, I think I read after my master's degree because I was so broken and, you know, and I was, I was trying so hard. I think I shared with you, I was raised, you know, holiness Pentecostal in <laughs> Arkansas with my mom's family. So every summer it's like, you know, speaking in tongues and running around and I was saw healing. And I mean, I was raised in that. And then at home, my dad's family was Baptist. So I was a Wana and I was like sword drills and girl of the year and chum of the month. And so I had the Bible, I had the gift. But, <laughs> <laughs> but but then Satan, like what I always say is, you know, and, and this is what I've thought was, I think the Lord just awakened me to this. I mean, the Lord, when we come out of the womb, it's like baby and there's purpose. And if we're not killed in the womb, which is the goal, it's it's game on. It's attack from day one. So if I was like all lit up in the church and loving the church and loving God as a kid and loving each side of it. I was a target and I was abused by a worship leader in the Pentecostal Mm -hmm. Holiness Church by the time I was 10. And it's just an earth shattering because that was my happy place. There was farms and puppies and horses I got to name when they're born. And it was my lightning bolt, like, and and it was on the way to church. And then he grabbed his guitar out of the truck and went to the front of the stage. And I'm in the truck, like, are you kidding me? Like, and you don't have words because you're a kid. And as a kid, you're a concrete thinker and you don't know. And and that was my favorite person. Like, you just don't even, you know, you feel like you're in a soap opera. And I remember just going in the bathroom. And when I came out, I'm like, okay, just gonna act like it didn't happen. I went and sat down by my other uncle. And he put his arm around me and I just, you know, from that moment on, I'm like, okay, is it going to happen again? And, and then 
it's it's the only thing in the world that when it happens to you, it's a crime of another, a sin of another. But that's why, like when the Bible says, confess your sins one to another. This was a sin done to me, but by not confessing it, I took on the shame and it just slowly changed me. And then I put myself in situations. I got drunk at like 13 and somebody had sex with me there and I have no memory. And and just the layers, Satan's like, we're not going to get this girl out of the shame. And I just stayed, but I worked so hard. I was journaled and like, God, I love you, but I couldn't tell anybody anything. And if Mm -hmm. we're not, that's why I'm so passionate about Real Talk because if there was some place that somehow I had gotten to speak that it wasn't my fault or that I was still okay, but I felt so damaged. And I think that over time, I, I threw effort, you know, and I had God, but I wasn't getting fully healed, squeaked my way through. I got a great job. I got into advertising. I got my master's, but I wasn't healed. And it's when I was already on stage at Willow and I was the director of equipping and training and I was, you know, the area pastor and all that. And super judgmental like so many of us christians can be and always seeing what everyone else needed to do that i had something with my third pregnancy that the lord called me um weirdly to a charismatic catholic priest for healing (laughs) long crazy story there but it was almost like taking all the denominations that had really wounded me it was a you know tongue speaking catholic that was like leading me through all this stuff but he just sort of went through and said we wanted to pray for the baby, but you know, the Lord's showing me there's something in the way. And it was the most biblical thing of confession and deliverance and repentance. And he just went door by door. Like I wow. had all these open doors in my life. Wow. But as a leader, I wasn't aware because I had grown up with them and they become normalized. And I think that's why the church is hesitant to talk about these hard conversations because they're not sure what's going to come out and they think the result will be punishment or shame versus like crazy freedom. I went through this deliverance with the charismatic Catholic priest, changed my life. And then when I ended up leading this anti-sex trafficking thing and I would sit with the girls and I would be leading the groups, they're telling me their stories. Their stories were the exact same as my stories. Like everyone wants to be like, oh, I wanna come see the puppy. Oh, it's a survivor. Oh, it's, you know, let me help them. It's like, they're just like us. I just kept trying to take it backwards. And the donors started coming and telling me their stories and giving me a check to tell me their story. They never told anybody. And there's just this hunger, you know, and the girls, one of the girls in our program, she said she was in rehab 23 times. They kept throwing her back in rehab and she didn't have an addiction problem. She had a shame problem. Right. And the minute we were able to get to this root level healing and bring the Holy Spirit in and you're still perfect. Like it's, you got to get that news. And I think all of us, the church, we need that news. We're sort of up here with the performance and we might dip a little for a little good counseling maybe, but the root level stuff that God wants to like, because all it does, like these wives that were like, well, you know, I sort of thought, but I never wanted to say, and I'm like, ladies, we got to make a t-shirt that says, you know, Hey ladies, we're not doing them any favors because if we're not speaking about it and we're not healed enough, Mm-hmm. to have the confidence to speak about it we're keeping them under their purpose we're living under our purpose so it's not like a we want to blow the lid because everybody's bad we want to blow the lid because the church has to take its power and its position if we're going to end anything 